Welcome back to our 2018 Virtual Genealogy Fair. If you're following along from home, this session number six is our final presentation for this year's fair. The lecture is accessible for all skill levels and is entitled America's Military Maid Call. Hello nurses, and our speaker is Anna Zarr. During this session, she will discuss Navy Nurse Corps and Army Nurse Corps histories, provide useful finding aids, and explain how to request records. Anna Zarr is an expert archives technician at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. I am now going to turn the broadcast over to Anna. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Zarr, and today I will be presenting on 20th century military nurses. Next slide, slide five. It would require an entirely different presentation to discuss all of the intricacies of civilian nurses in federal service. So the focus of this presentation is on military nurses. The easiest way to determine if the nurse you're researching was civilian or military is to look at who they worked for. Military nurses worked for the United States Navy, Army, and Air Force, etc. Civilian nurses could work for almost any federal agency, but usually for agencies such as the War Department, Department of the Navy, and the Department of Veterans Affairs, just to name a few. Public health service nurses could be both. For example, the Cadet Nurse Corps nurses. Ancestry has a great collection of World War II Cadet Nursing Corps card files. Ancestry is available at NARA facilities and most local libraries. Check your local library for information about ancestry access. To request records of civilian nurses in federal service, contact the National Archives at St. Louis. Next slide, slide six. Before we jump into the records, I'd like to provide a brief history of the nurse corps. The Army Nurse Corps was established in 1901, while the Navy Nurse Corps followed in 1908. At the, beginning of this, uh, at the beginning of the nurse corps, the nurses were not considered much more than uniformed civilians, but by World War I, they were invaluable to the armed forces. The Red Cross was a great recruiter for nurses in World War I. Red Cross nurses sent to France as members of the armed forces would be considered American Expeditionary Forces, AEF. But there were Americans, to include nurses, who worked with the British Expeditionary Forces, BEF, as well. A Red Cross nurse may have started as a civilian volunteer and incorporated into an active military Army Nurse Corps member out of necessity. The Red Cross continued to recruit nurses well into World War II. Next slide, slide seven. From 1901 to 1920, Army nurses were appointed to the military without military rank. In 1920, Army nurses were made temporary officers with relative rank starting with second lieutenant and in 1947, Army nurses were permanent appointed military officers. From 1908 to 1942, Navy nurses were appointed to the military without military rank as well. In 1942, Navy nurses were made temporary officers with relative, relative rank starting with ensign, and by 1948, Navy Nurse Corps nurses were permanent appointment, appointed military officers. The relative rank given to nurses was supposed to be equivalent to male officers of the same level, but the nurses were not paid equally, nor were they treated with the same respect. Flight nursing began during World War II, with the Air, Army Air Force's first graduating class in 1943, followed by the Navy in 1944. Pictured here is Navy Flight Nurse Lieutenant Lorraine McNaughton Knight, who started her Navy Nurse Corps career on September 30th, 1940. By May 7, 1945, she became a Naval Flight Nurse and throughout her time in the Navy, served under various Naval Air Flight Squadrons. On January 20th, 1947, she returned from overseas on leave as a passenger on a hospital plane, which crashed at Oakland, California. As a result of the crash and the contingent fire, her personal property was completely destroyed, but she survived with minimal internal injuries. In 1948, Lieutenant Knight was aboard the Caroline Mars on its record-breaking 24-hour nonstop flight. By the end of her military service in 1951, Lieutenant Knight had over two years of overseas service assisting with air evacuation matters and became a flying liaison officer and instructor 
at the School of Aviation Medicine at Gunter Air Force Base. The Army and the Air Force Nurse Corps officially separated in 1949. Although the Army and Air Force had medics, they did not formally accept male nurses until 1955. Similarly, the Navy had corpsmen, but did not formally accept male nurses until 1964. The first male Army nurse was 2nd Lieutenant Edward T. Lyon. The male, first male Navy nurse was Ensign George M. Silver. Next slide, slide eight. The United States Armed Forces were racially segregated until 1948, when President Harry S. Truman signed the executive order to desegregate. The Army Nurse Corps only had 14 Native Americans during World War I. It was also during World War I that the Army Nurse Corps began appointing black nurses, and by World War II, there were thousands. The Navy Nurse Corps, on the other hand, only started appointing black nurses during World War II, but there were only four. Of the four, only one stayed in after the war, Lieutenant Junior Grade Edith DeVoe. The two great photographs shown here are both from Edith DeVoe's archival Navy official military personnel file. Next slide, slide nine. Shortly after midnight on July 12, 1973, a fire was reported at National Personnel Records Center's Military Personnel Records Building. The official military personnel files, OMPFs, of Army and Air Force nurses may have been lost, burned, or damaged. Prior to the fire, the Army nurse personnel files for the World War I period were the second largest in bulk next to commissioned officers. Fortunately, the National Archives at St. Louis houses non-OMPF records that may supplement the deficit the fire caused. To learn more about the burned files and how they are preserved, check out the 2000 VGF presentation called A is for Archives, B is for Burn File by Ashley Cox. Next slide, slide 10. If you're unsure where to begin your research, start with requesting an OMPF, the Official Military Personnel File. If the file was damaged in the fire, you will be notified. This photograph is of World War I Army Reserve Nurse Dorothy Tarbox. She was incredibly fortunate that her OMPF is completely intact and was never affected by the fire. It is rare, but not unheard of. Due to the rolling accession date, more OMPFs become archival each day. The accession files are records of military service members whose date of separation from service was at least 62 years ago. Please note that non-accession records are subject to access restrictions imposed under the Department of Defense Privacy Act rules. Next slide. Slide 11. OMPFs may contain military service dates, disciplinary actions, awards earned, foreign or sea service, military schooling and training, and some even contain photographs. Depending on the era a nurse retired, resigned, or was discharged, the separation document she received may not be a DD Form 214, Report of Separation, because it was not used until January 1, 1950. Next slide, slide 12. Navy OMPFs were spared by the 1973 fire, but like I mentioned before, Navy nurses were not officers until 1942. What does that mean for the nurses who served in the Navy Nurse Corps prior to that? It means that they may have an enlisted OMPF. An index of the enlisted Navy records for World War I and pre-World War II are on the National Archives catalog. Navy nurses during World War I may not have had an enlisted OMPF, unlike most enlisted yeomanettes. Shown here is an example of the Navy Nurse Corps Superintendent Lena S. Higby's enlisted record. Even though she was the highest ranking nurse in the Navy Nurse Corps, she still only had an enlisted OMPF. The image on the right is the front cover of her enlisted record jacket. The record documents and enlisted OMPFs are usually trifolded. At the bottom of the record jacket, it states, Awarded Navy Cross for Distinguished Service in line of her professional duty, 11-11-1920. Within her record, I found the citation for the award, which states, Madam, the President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Navy Cross to Lena S. Higby, Superintendent, Navy Nurse Corps for, the ser for Services during World War, the World War, as set forth in the following citation. 
for distinguished service in the line of her professional duty as superintendent of the Navy Nurse Corps. Next slide, slide 13. Potentially, a Navy nurse could both have both an enlisted and an officer OMPF, but more commonly, a retroactive officer OMPF file may have been created. Much like with Army OMPFs, it shows appointments, oaths of service, and resignations. Fitness reports and efficiency reports may list when and where a nurse was stationed. It may also contain some personal telegrams and correspondence between the nurse, her family, and the Navy. The top right example is a telegram from Navy Nurse Corps Commander Laura M. Cobb's sister, asking the Navy if her sister, who was a chief nurse at the time, was safe or a prisoner of war in the Philippines. The nurse in question, Laura Cobb, is in the long white dress uniform. Sadly, she was indeed a prisoner of war and was so for nearly three years. She continued service until she retired in 1947. Lastly, the, the officer OMPF may contain photographs of the nurse during her time in the Navy. Next slide, slide 14. What if the OMPF you requested is not archival? <clears throat> the Freedom of Information Act allows the release of certain non-archival record documents and information, which is transcribed, photocopied, or a combination of both in order to comply with your request. Navy nurse Ellen Doloff, pictured on the right, was one of 29 nurses serving at the Naval Hospital uh, during the attack on Pearl Harbor. On the left is the Navy unit commendation awarded to those nurses for extremely meritorious service in support of military operations during the enemy at Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, territory of Hawaii, on December 7, 1941. Alert and prompt in preparing for any emergency after approximately 20 Japanese planes appeared over the buildings en route to attack Pacific Fleet ships and shore installations. The staff of the United States Naval Hospital immediately manned firefighting and battle dressing stations, thereby making possible the rapid extinguishing of flames when a blazing hostile plane crashed and ignited the hospital shortly after the attack had begun. As a heavy stream of casualties began flowing in, this gallant organization expended every effort in utilizing all available facilities and worked without thought of rest for, or for the relief of the hundreds of injured rendering further efficient service by, by maintaining complete records. The courage, initiative, and valiant devotion to, truly, to duty displayed by the personnel attached to the Naval Hospital throughout this period of extreme emergency were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Award citations and photographs are some of the documents that are releasable under the Freedom of Information Act. Next slide, slide 15. How can you request an OMPF? Submit standard form 180 to the National Personnel Records Center. If the record you're requesting may potentially be fire related, also submit the NA form 13075 to allow for additional information needed for record reconstruction. Certain persons of exceptional prominence, PEPs, are on the NARA catalog. For example, Colonel Ruby, Colonel Ruby Bradley, Army Nurse Corps, and Captain Mary T. Klinker, Air Force Nurse Corps. Every nurse has a story to tell. For example, Ensign Susan M. Levine, now known as Susan Shaw, pictured second from the left, was tried and convicted by General Court Martial in 1969 for anti-war activities while a member of the U.S. Navy. The National Archives at St. Louis has Navy Court Martial records for the years 1951 to 1976, and they are open to the public. Next slide, slide 16. If you've ever requested a Navy nurse ONPF and were told that nothing existed, there may be a Navy Nurse Corps Professional Jacket, also known as the Navy Pro Jacket. They are the newest accession at the National Archives at St. Louis and my personal favorite collection. These records are what really piqued my interest in military nurses and I haven't looked back. They range from the inception of the Navy Nurse Corps in 1908 to the mid-1950s. They are very similar to Navy officer OMPS, and there may even be crossover. The Pro Jackets contain personnel documents of nurses serving in the Navy Nurse Corps 
and the dates of service and type of discharge are often found on the front side of the personnel jacket. Next slide, slide 17. They may also contain applications for appointment, which could list prior civilian education, military service, and federal service. Without a rank for over 30 years, there had to be a way to differentiate between the hierarchy of nurses. So you'll find the title of the nurse listed throughout the pro jacket, and her title may change over time if she received a promotion or she became active or reserve. The nurse's service number may be listed in the record. If she did not receive one in service, she may have been given one retroactively. Health surveys and physicals in the pro jacket may list next of kin information. Next slide, slide 18. Navy Pro Jackets may contain various service record cards about training, professional qualifications, and personnel related data. They may also contain applications or documents from nursing organizations like the Red Cross. The example on the left is an American Red Cross nursing service application for War Reserve, First Reserve, and Second Reserve. It lists the name and address of the nearest relative or friend residing in the United States. The example on the right is a training card for Lou Willa Juanita Harriman King. She had requested training to be a flight nurse in 1948, but disapproved by the advisory board in 1949 because no senior lieutenants were assigned courses that year. It lists her nursing organization as a registered nurse with the VA. If you like the photograph of her on this slide, just wait. Next slide, slide 19. Here's another example of a service record card called the history card. It may provide a brief overview of service. Like with Navy officer OMPFs, the pro jackets will contain information relating to dates of appointment to separation, miscellaneous orders where they are being stationed, and performance reports. There are often handwritten letters and typed correspondence from the veterans, their families, and the Navy Nurse Corps. These may plainly list the next of kin and beneficiaries' addresses. Next slide, slide 20. Pro jackets may also contain vital records such as birth, marriage, and baptism records. These may be especially helpful when researching next of kin. I also enjoy finding vital records in these files because each one is so unique. Next slide, slide 21. Pro jackets may contain several photographs while some of the earlier pro jackets in the collection do not have any. These photographs are one of the reasons I fell in love with these records. Since many of the nurses stayed in service for many years, it is really neat to see how they matured. Remember Lou Willow Juanita Harriman King? She has three more photographs on this slide. The two pictures on the bottom left and the middle row on the left. Next slide, slide 22. If you've requested the OMPF and it was negative, or you want to find additional records for your nurse, begin with the VA Master Index. I utilize it nearly every day for military reference. The VA Master Index files provide useful information for research. The two examples shown here are from the wars prior to the 1940 series, highlighting the World War I era. Both show full names that may include additional maiden or married surnames. Knowing all names will definitely assist your research and may give you another name to request an OMPF or pro jacket. Below the name, it may list branch of service, unit affiliation, rank or title, with an address used in or prior to military service. You might notice that one of these examples doesn't list a service number under SN. Army nurses were not given service numbers until 1922, and Navy nurses were not given service numbers until 1919. Each card is individualized and may list dates of birth and death, but keep in mind, the date of death could be well in or after military service and could list military entrance and separation dates. One of the handouts for this presentation is the VA Master Index Key to Codes and Prefixes. This would be a good time to use it. On the right-hand side of the index, there are letters. Each one is a code or prefix that may be used to verify and cross-reference information if you're unsure if you have the correct person. C stands for claim number. A claim number was assigned whenever a veteran made an application for benefits such as service-connected disability, pension, education, and training. XC indicates that the veteran is deceased. 
World War I veterans were paid a sum of money based on their service during the World War, commonly referred to as a bonus. Veterans who were eligible for bonuses were given an A number. The A stands for adjusted compensation. The bottom example is one of the 14 Native American World War I Army nurses, Charlotte Anderson. Next slide, slide 23. The VA Master Index Files are also known as the VA Tape. It is an index of claims filed with the Department of Veterans Affairs. They contain cards from more than 34 million veterans spanning from prior wars to 1940 and World War II through 1972. The Prior Wars microfilm is available for use in the public research room. If you're unable to visit it in St. Louis, that's okay. The good news is that the Prior Wars were digitized this year and are on family search. The World War II microfilm may contain social security numbers and cannot be digitized. However, it is available to the public by request only. The examples shown here are for World War II era. While doing research for this presentation, I came across the list of Navy nurses who were prisoners of war in the Philippines during World War II. And one name I really wanted to check out on the VA tape was for Ensign Difna Petronilla Alfonia Marie Van Gorp, who provides a great example of multiple middle names being listed. A couple of tips about the VA tapes that may assist in your research are, it may only list one branch of service when the nurse may have served in two, and there may be multiple service numbers listed. Next slide, slide 24. If the VA index is negative or inconclusive because it doesn't list a service number, or maybe you're looking for large groups of nurses, what can be checked? Use finding aids and primary record sources available in our public research room or through subscription services like Ancestry. The term service or serial may be used interchangeably, interchangeably, but ultimately they mean the same thing. Like I mentioned earlier, nurses were not enlisted, but also not quite commissioned officers either. So service numbers given to the Army Nurse Corps may not have been given at all, or retroactively given after separation from service. Or she may have had two or more service numbers because she served in both the Army and Navy Nurse Corps. Common prefixes you may encounter are A for Army, N for Nurse, and AN for Army Nurse. Enlisted service numbers usually have seven to eight digits, while officer service numbers have three to seven. There are exceptions to the amount of digits the service number may have, but for all intents and purposes, a blanket digit amount works. Examples shown here is, the example shown here is from an Army officer register list from Ancestry. The bottom, exam, or the bottom name listed is Captain Adolfa M. Meyer, Army Nurse Corps retired, who is from St. Louis, Missouri, and a prisoner of war in the Philippines during World War II. Other primary record sources that we haven't covered yet that may list service number are deceased veterans' claims, XC files, nurses' medical cards, and World War II Army nurse cards. Next slide, slide 25. The World War II Army nurse cards are, were indexed as of July 10, 1944. The information located on these cards may be redundant with other finding aids, but keep in mind, this is an, an auxiliary record that helps with record reconstruction for OMPS that may have been affected by the 1973 fire. They may contain name, service number, rank, address, and name changes. When you request them, give all known surnames. Not all Army nurses who served during World War II will be in this series. The bottom example is Captain Maud C. Davison, Chief Nurse of the Army Nurse Corps in the Philippines during World War II, and an Angel of Baton Prisoner of War. Next slide, slide 26. Navy service number information is very similar, very similar to Army service numbers. A common prefix and suffix that may be listed are N for Nurse and W for Women. As previously mentioned, it is possible for Navy nurses to have more than one service number or none at all. Retroactive service numbers and rank may have been given or the nurse may be listed as retired with no service number given. There is one big difference between Army officer registers and Navy officer registers. Navy officer registers may list a designator number. Designator numbers are used to identify the primary naval specialty of an officer. Navy Nurse Corps Officer Designator Numbers start with 290, with the last digit denoting the officer's type of commission. 2900 means an officer of the regular Navy whose permanent grade is ensign or above. 
2903 means an officer of the regular Navy who is on the list of permanent or temporary retired officers. The examples shown here are Navy nurse officer registers from Ancestry. The top example shows Captain Sue Dowser, retired superintendent of the Navy Nurse Corps with a designator number of 2903. The bottom example shows the Nurse Corps listed as its own entity. This would be a great place to research nurses who served during the same time. Some registers may also list date or year of birth, which is helpful if you're unsure if you've located the right person. Next slide, slide 27. The Department of the Army's nurses' medical cards from 1912 to 1939 are an excellent auxiliary record for Army OMPFs affected by the 1973 fire. The medical cards are available for use in our public research room. The 1918 influenza pandemic did not spare anyone, and nurses themselves became patients among the soldiers and civilians they were treating. These two examples show two nurses, three months, and thousands of miles apart, who were both afflicted by the flu. Next slide. Slide 28. These cards may contain full name, demographic information, rank and title, and service number. They may even list the events leading to a nurse's demise. Even though they are available for public use, third-party information may be subject to the privacy exemptions of the Freedom of Information Act. Re related record groups are the World War I nurse pay cards and vouchers and return of the nurse corps files. Slide, uh, next slide. Slide 29. World War I Army nurse pay cards are an auxiliary record used to reconstruct vital military data that may have been destroyed. The pay cards may include name, rank or title, duty component, and final pay date. On the top card, please make notice of the bonus, $60 final. This was indicative of an adjusted compensation bonus, which may have been found on the VA Master Index tapes. The dispersing officer information is required for requesting World War I nurses' final pay vouchers. Next slide, slide 30. The World War I nurses' final pay vouchers, like the pay cards, are an auxiliary record to offset the damage caused by the 1973 fire. If a nurse has a pay card, it does not guarantee that there will be a final pay voucher in this series. She may have had service past World War I. The information located from these vouchers contain <clears throat> full name, rank and title, organizational unit, date of oath and entry into service, and date of separation from active duty. The station locations for duty and separation from service can be useful when requesting return of the nurse corps records. Next slide, slide 31. Return of the Nurse Corps records are an auxiliary file used to help reconstruct World War I era OMPFs affected by the fire. Most contain, state, uh, most contain a range of dates spanning one month to four years depending on the installation station. The nurses are listed on each sheet within categorical groupings, such as chief nurse, active duty and reserve nurses, and personnel losses from the unit. These files may also contain information regarding rank, transfers, illnesses, deaths, marriages, promotions, and demotions, discharges, leave, and miscellaneous documents and orders for that unit. Next slide, slide 32. Military installations in the United States and overseas may have been the same location, but over time the name may have changed. For example, the base hospital number 21 unit from the Washington University Medical School in St. Louis, Missouri, took over for the number 12 British General Hospital in Rouen, France in 1917. Next slide, slide 33. The return of the nurse corps records include installations stateside, some US territories, and overseas with the American and British expedition British Expeditionary Forces to include Red Cross hospitals. The U.S. Army Medical Department Office of Medical History has a great summary of World War I Red Cross nurses in France and how they became members of the Army Nurse Corps. Next slide, slide 34. There cannot be war without casualties and there cannot be life without death. Death in service may be listed in personnel records, but the reason of demise may be vague or unavailable. Nurses were right behind the front lines, and in some cases, on the front line. 
they were not immune from being killed in action, dying of wounds, or from disease. Some deaths in service were self-inflicted, while others were simply accidents. The example shown here is a World War II Army Individual Deceased Personnel File of Nurse Laverne Farquhar, who was killed at the Battle of Anzio. Records directly relating to death in service are burial case files, individual deceased personnel files, IDPFs, deceased veterans claims, XC files, OMPFs, and Navy Pro Jackets. Next slide, slide 35. Burial case files, also known as 293 files, are records of the Office of the Quartermaster General. The records are for all branches and may contain reports, telegrams, and other documents relating to burial of service personnel. They may also contain the organizational unit, service number, and XC of the veteran. Next slide, slide 36. They may contain handwritten letters and typed correspondence from the next of kin, applications for headstones, and grave registration service forms. The grave location form, which is the middle example, lists place and cause of death and date and place of burial, and it also lists the nearest relative and their address. Army nurse military installations, like Base Hospital 35, shown in the left example, located in the bear file, burial file, should be used to request return of the nurse corps record. Next slide, slide 37. What are Gold Star Mothers? The U.S. government paid for an overseas trip for the mother or eligible family member of the fallen World War I nurse to see where their daughter was interred. The program was not restricted to just nurses, but to all service members of the armed forces buried overseas. Gold Star Mother documents may, may be located in the burial files to include trip itineraries, photographs of the mother, and additional information relating to the pilgrimage. The mother of deceased World War I Army nurse, Esther Amundsen, ended up getting sick with fatigue and cold, wet feet while at the cemetery and was given brandy as the treatment. Another interesting document found in this burial file was the original Pullman Company train ticket stub from her trip. Next slide, slide 38. Individual deceased personnel files, IDPFs, dates vary by branch. For Army IDPFs of the World War II and Korean eras, we currently only have surnames A through L, but surnames M through Z can still be requested through the National Archives St. Louis. However, we do have all surnames for the Vietnam era. The top example is for, from Air Force Nurse Ma Captain Mary T. Klinker, her Vietnam mortuary file. Sadly, Captain Klinker died in a plane crash in Vietnam during Operation Baby Lift. She is one of the PEPs I mentioned earlier, whose OMPF is digitized and on the NARA catalog. In the PDF version of this presentation, her picture is linked to her catalog entry. For more information about IDPFs, I recommend checking out the 2014 Virtual Genealogy Fair presentation. Next slide, slide 39. Deceased Veterans Claims, XC Files. They are the successor series to the pension files. The National Archives in Washington, D.C. also has a collection of pension files for years prior to 1898. XC files that have not been accessioned by the National Archives can be requested from the VA directly. These records were created prior to and after death of service members. The C and XC number may be found on the VA Master Index. Next slide, slide 40. The XC files may contain vital records such as birth, marriage, and death certificates. There may also be medical records and documents with military service dates. Next slide, slide 41. A common document in XC files are affidavits. The affidavit shown here is for age verification of a deceased nurse signed by her sister. The example on the right shows beneficiary information, XC number, and application number, which may be on the VA master index. Next slide. Slide 42. You can begin your military nurse research right here at the National Archives of St. Louis. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much, Anna. So we have a few questions lined up for you online and I'm sure some more will come in. So let's get started with what I have so far. Uh, someone asked, could someone whose job 
I'm not sure you'll be able to answer this, but let's give it a try. Could someone whose job was a bacteriologist and a laboratory technician, could that person have entered the Army as part of the nurse corps? Um, potentially, they may have been um, along for the ride, essentially. On the return of the nurse corps records, there may show some civilian service. Uh, so if the person was requesting um, that person in question, they could always request the uh, OPF for the War Department or any umbrella agency they may be affiliated with, and we can give you a positive or negative or essentially tell you where to go uh, if all of the responses are negative so far. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're also wondering, the Navy Pro Jacket, the person's assuming that it's not an OMPF, so how do you request a Navy Pro Jacket? To request a Navy Pro Jacket, you can, um, just like I said at the beginning of the presentation, you can contact the National Archives at St. Louis uh, for RLSO and just request it. You can also request it on the SF-180. That is one of the um, documents that I provided as a handout. Uh, the technicians who receive the re these requests will know specifically to um, forward it to the correct office. Thank you. Let's see, we have someone who says, uh, it's about the waves. If someone was a college student who joined the waves while in college, where would those records be? Those records would be with us as well. Um, whenever they wanted to do something relating to Navy service, um, if we know for sure they were enlisted, once again, just fill out the 180 that I've um, done as the handout. And when it's submitted to the National Personnel Records Center, they will order the OMPF for that or for that person. Thank you, Anna. So um, while we're waiting to see if any more questions come up, I wanted to let you know that you've already gotten a lot of kudos online. Thank you, everybody, for giving us your comments. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, please ask you to fill out the evaluation form. We really love your feedback. It's in a link under the more information right here on this screen below the video. So I'm looking to see if there's any more questions. And it looks like that is it. So I'm gonna turn the microphone back over to Brittany Crawford. This concludes our sessions for the two, 2018 Virtual Genealogy Fair. Thank you so much for joining us. If you missed the lecture, the videos and handouts will remain available on the fair's website. Thank you for participating. If you have lingering questions, check our website. You can visit us in person or send us an email at inquire at nara.gov.